All right, it is 7.30. We got time to go live. We live? We're live. Yeah. All right. Welcome to this meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society. I'm your president, Bob Trembley. Um, so I'd ask you if we have any, we're meeting for the first time in person at Macomb Community College and the room is, yeah, the, the standing room only. We've got only six people here right now, but um, the room they scheduled us in was, had a class in it. So Dale Parton luckily was able to quickly uh, call security and get us into an empty room across the hall. So uh, panic avoided. Um, so, um, <clears throat> For current members, if you need to renew your membership, you can do it online via PayPal. And uh, thanks, thanks to Dale Parton for arranging this, this getting us back in person at Macomb. Yeah, applause all around. So um, we have a new AV volunteer who is not here tonight. <laughs> so she she uh, she volunteered to, to help set up uh, at at Cranbrook. Hopefully she'll be back there. We are I, we are running on the club's new laptop right now, which has a very good camera, and uh, we we have a, we have a, we have to set up our new microphone and stuff and get a camera to see the audience and stuff. So we're still still an AV setup. So uh, officers. Uh, Time to start getting your reports for uh, the newsletter next time. Um, the Metro Parks update. Um, I mentioned at Cranbrook, I'll, I'll say again for those of you who didn't hear, um, the, the problem with the waiver for our volunteers at the Metro Parks is pretty much vaporized. We um, have a memorandum of understanding with the Metro Parks, and we also have insurance. So their lawyers said, as long as you got that, your volunteers do not need to sign a waiver and you can go ahead and uh, just set up uh, your telescopes at any metro park. So our, our MOU covers all the Michigan metro parks. So and uh, they we're, we have a list of events that they're going to have us uh, that want, they want a volunteer for. And I'll be working with our outreach guy to uh, get people scheduled for that. Um, we on our info line and all. The WAS and the Vatican Observatory Foundation are starting to get questions about, are you organizing trips for the uh, uh, eclipse happening next year? And uh, pretty much the response from both of us is, well, everybody is pretty much doing it on their own. We're not doing anything club-wise. We like we like herding cats anyway. Um, but that doesn't mean we're not going to do it. So we're, we're still a little bit off. Um, we will be we will be posting something on that. Uh, you're going to want to start getting your reservations like now if you're going to be if you're going to be going anywhere to do that. My wife and I are going to uh, visit my daughter in uh, Texas, and she's like right on the uh, totality line. So, um, Stargate is Saturday the 25th, um, and we have an in-person discussion group at Laura Wade's house in Bloomfield Hills on March 28th. So, um, in-person discussion group, yay. Yeah, if anyone needs details, just reach out and get Um, officer's report. So you pretty much had mine there. Dale, did you want to, did you want to speak really quick? Always looking for new people to speak. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I'm always looking for new people to speak. So please email me if you have something you'd like to speak about, or if there's something you'd be interested in me trying to find a speaker for. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. So I have a couple ideas for Dale. I want to do a couple things on Stellarium. Found some cool things Stellarium can do this morning. So uh, Jeff McLeod. We have said we have Stargate coming up. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. So open house was good. Not really good scene, but good. Where's the camera? This one. Okay. All right. You people come out of the internet and come to things. Uh, the V's gonna have. Well, he can go to Southern California. 
Uh, Arizona. Arizona. I thought it was going. All right. Anyway, uh, shows how much I pay attention. Uh, our next open house is on the 25th. It's going to be perfectly clear. There's going to be awesome things to look at. Come out to Stargate. Uh, the other stuff that I'm currently managing is the discussion group. Uh, we have one tentatively scheduled for April, but it's astrophotography specific of any skill level. Ooh, get at me if you're interested. The person that's hosting wants to know if anyone's going to show up. I think if at least two people say they're going to show up, we'll do it. We don't have a date yet because we don't know if we're doing it. In April, it'll probably be in late April, like most of our discussion groups. You, you want early April? I'll make it early April. In uh, Rochester, Boothville Hills, that, that side of town. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the other thing, snack. Okay. I got one. Okay. I got possibly two. All right. I'm going to get uh, snacks and discussion groups. So I'm going to be twisting arms. So better stay away from me. All right. Jeff McLeod, our second VP. Adrian, you want to do a really quick uh, treasurer's report for us? Really quick. Um, our report will be in the WASP, but the uh, important thing to know is that the computer that we're doing this um, recently expended around a grand for it, and it is our new um, computer for hybrid events. So. So now I guess we have an AV person, so I don't have to also be the AV person. And um, as far as treasury, we're still holding tight at close to $30,000 in our main account. And PayPal generally sits around at $500 of virtual liquid income, so, or liquid cash. So we've got other things. I see Riyadh, you're here. Jeff, I don't know if any of the, uh, projects coming up that are going to need some funding yeah so so oh, we're gonna spend some of this real we had real money that's why we walked into micro center and walked out with a solid i did not want to buy the best and macintosh didn't seem to work well at cranbrook so that was out so we just got a basic pc but it's a solid pc with a with solid running parts, and so far it's doing pretty good. We could have, but then David wouldn't have been able to see us as easily as he can when uh, we use a computer instead. So, uh, so that's it for the treasure report. And Bob, uh, back to you. All right, uh, Mark. Six calendars left. And and the uh, the uh, minutes from the board meeting are in the wasp. So, uh, it's Kevin here. Kevin Outreach. Thanks for Outreach right now. Uh, publications, Dale, the last is up. Anything else to add? Well, I want to address something that uh, Jeff said earlier, and that is uh, from my location in Florida, the 840 plus mile trip uh, for the commute keeps me from attending in person any of this events, but uh, it's looking like I'll be moving to Kalamazoo uh, really? sometime in April. So at least I'd be a little closer and I can make some of the meetings. Oh, that's cool. So that's the good news for this month. Okay. Um, I'm going to do it impromptu in the news right now. I don't know whether you saw this, but on the 15th, NASA had a press release out that they have confirmed active volcanism on venus and uh they've, they've sifted through old magellan data and uh they have seen a what appears to be a lava flow while magellan was in orbit so yay for sifting through old data so that that was that was that was yeah they needed a source picked it up not what you guys can hear me on the computer a video source picked it up and after the venus jupiter which i maybe they think it was a miss we did not see news on social media about things to happen in 2024. one of them is not the eclipses that are coming up we're seeing things about a hmm. brand new comet coming through and we're seeing um uh, seeing other 
noteworthy news or yeah, we're seeing other things being um, put in, in social media in the by the news outlets and that what should, should be uh, that that's kind of weird. So yeah. we need to start pushing it and getting good data out there rather than letting all letting all of the hacks put the bad data out there. Well, they're, they're talking about a comet that could be the brightest yet ever. Oh wow, just like Ison was just the comet like, of the century. Yeah, yeah it's okay. happening and they're talking about yeah. 2024. And so to me, 2024 ought to be about what goes on on April 8th, not whether or not this comet comes anywhere close to heaven all right special interest groups first one david levy hi david can't hear you uh oh no audio there i hope you can hear me now there you go yeah i guess now i've been promoted to a special interest group um there was uh, yesterday did any of you see the prominences on the sun yesterday enormous ones the size of jupiter leaping off the surface of the sun <clears throat> very visible in the uh, h alpha light so for the poetry today i was trying to find anything about any poem that had to do with sunspots and at the same time a poem that really celebrated venus because uh, um, bob just mentioned about the uh, Active volcanism on Venus, which nobody is surprised about. It's already hot enough there. <clears throat> but anyway, I did find a poem written by a very minor. <clears throat> sorry about that. Sorry. Written by a very minor poet that I'm sure none of you have ever heard of. This minor English poet was an amateur astronomer. He had a telescope, although Dawes invited him to look through the big refractor in London whenever he wanted to. This minor insignificant poet, his name was Alfred Lord Tennyson. And yeah, I think you've all heard of him. It turns out that I know his great, great grandson. I went to London, visited with him and had a very, very good meeting with him. We talked a little bit about his great, great grandfather. But here's the poetry, the poetry that I'd like to read to you today. It is from In Memoriam, and the first stanza has to do with the sunspots. And was the day of my delight as pure and perfect as I say. The very source and fount of day is dashed with wandering isles of night. And finally, the same poem, another part of In Memoriam, deals with Venus. Not so much Venus in his modern name, but Phosphor as the morning star and Hesper as the evening star. Bright phosphor, fresher for the night. By thee the world's great work is heard, beginning, and the wakeful bird behind thee comes the greater light. Sweet Hesper, phosphor, double name for what is one, the first, the last. Thou, like my present and my past, thy place is changed. Thou art the same. Bob, thank you, and back to you. All right, I'm sticking my tablet up to the camera here, and this is the uh, sun for the last 48 hours. So there are indeed some monster prominences there. All right, so solar is we're, we're heading into solar. Well, solar uh, special interest group. We're heading into solar maximum, so we're starting to see more sunspots, more prominences, and. Uh, like I say, every every meeting, my my, um, my phone is vibrating off of my table with announcements of solar flares. So, uh, Riyadh, are you on? Yes, double star. Are we going to have some double star uh, uh, searching at our well, next since, Stargate? Yeah, I mean, since uh, Jeff said uh, it's going to be perfectly clear, then yes, <laughs> we will be very busy observing lots and lots of double stars. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, observing reports. Do we have any observing reports? The moon. All, all the guys that would be sharing uh, all of their astrophotographies are here in the audience, so they're not going to be uh, sharing that tonight. So, uh, what, what 
coming evening was uh, the tadpole nebula. I don't know if you guys can hear. Can you guys hear that? We we don't know if uh, the microphone's picking up the audience there. I I see four ten the tadpole nebula. Dale Dale Hollenbach. So I have a So, into the sky. You see, I can do this. I can do this. Yeah. So, in the sky, talking to everyone else. Um, so, the in the northern hemisphere, the core is coming back. In the southern hemisphere, it's heading towards fall and winter, um, where the core goes directly up above their night sky, and they see both of them. So Milky Way photographers, uh, anyways, um, Milky Way photographers love shooting at the core. Astrophotographers and binocular astronomers like looking at the core because when you go up the core, you see things like M8. If you're good, you see M20. And you'll see M22. Then you'll see M23. Then you'll see M24. Then you'll see the Sagittarius star cloud. Then M25. Then you'll see the clusters in M16 and M17. And You'll see after some dark lanes, you'll see M11. All of these things go straight up the uh, northern part of the bulge and are fairly easy to spot. You just pretty much kind of go left and right. And if you're at a dark enough site, you can start picking out the dark lanes or the, the uh, dark nebulae, LBN objects. And those show up in binoculars. Around here, you got to go probably up to here and get away from the light here and get up to here before you start seeing the dust lines. But how do you know if you're in a dark spot? You, you'll find out when I do my presentation. It's this, this is gonna play a role in uh, getting good data. The starlight that you see, depending on where you've been, is gonna, You'll go to Lake Hudson and say, this is the darkest place I've ever been. Two years later, if you end up in Oklahoma, you're going to be awful. And then you're going to go back to Lake Hudson and you're going to go, really? So, um, so yeah, that's the sky is rolling back to summer, but Orion at sunset is sitting dead in the sky. Those of you that like to look at the winter circle, you have basically one month, maybe two left. Near the end of April, Orion will start setting as the sun is setting. And that'll be it for the winter circle. So, thank you. Right. So, if we, we don't have any more astrophotography, does anybody have any astrophotography they want to share that's online right now? Gotta have, we got to have an astrophotographer online from now on. <laughs> yeah, we're all we're all here in person at Macomb. All right, so uh, failing that, why don't we start our break now and reconvene at uh, what quarter after eight? So uh, take a break. Go get a munchie. Go get a bio and talk astronomy and reconvene at eight fifteen. We'll leave the uh, we'll leave this on. We'll leave this on so people from the room can come. I'll I'll aim it on the audience. I'll bounce this thing up to you. There we go. Or we'll just accept cash, which is one thousand dollars per Whatever you want to do, it will go for six. I'm about to indulge to this folder.
And this time, I have to remember to bring actual treasury and stuff. And then you'll never see what Yes, we have cups. We're over there. Okay. It's really. Yeah. Uh, you can't do real. Where are you I'm putting on them. Because I'll probably cash this after I'm done speaking. So that you know, because there's. Yeah, I I if we have something that can work off the top of the tank of the third, I go yeah, I mean, we, if, we, if we're going to custom make a tablecloth and those we'll things, we can make it look cool. Yeah. Wow. What about, what about something like kind of big, you know, like the size of that? Wow. Adrian, are you there? Sign me up for the call. Someone stole it from out the back then. I don't know where. Come on, Okay. Maybe it's a call. It is all you. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. I mean, whatever. This is me what they. I don't even know your last year in existence, but 
David, Adrian, how goes it? Fine. I just wanted to let. I'm doing well. I just wanted to let you know that I, I've just sent you an email with the poem you asked for. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, that. That's going to be a very good poem to add to my presentations after tonight. Um, I want to share that poem, that edited poem, everywhere that I do a presentation. I um, I think it'll it'll speak clearly to what I see about these dark skies. So thank you for sending it. I am so honored that you're going to use it, Adrian. That's great. In fact, yeah, if you want me to do it tonight, fact, like this presentation, or thing, I'd be happy this presentation to. that you see, I'm going to have the poem somewhere in here. I'm going to figure out a good place to put it. Maybe instead of this, I'll have the poem. Okay. So that will um, that will grace my future presentations. Well, thank you, Adrian. Gosh, that really makes my day. Absolutely, no problem. Thank you. Yep. So hopefully we'll see you. Hopefully you'll see me next week on a Global Star Party. I may be busy next Tuesday, but I will try and hop in where I can. I'll have to see what's going on. Um, I'm on vacation, but I'm going to be at the Ann Arbor Film Festival doing some oh. photography. So. But uh, Tuesday nights, I try to save my Tuesday nights. Even if I'm bowling, I try to leave bowling and I come and do the um, presentations for uh, Global Star Party. Well, I'm glad that so, you do. Good to see you there. We'll see if that happens. Great. Thanks, Adrian. Plenty of time. Yeah. All right. Well, I'd love to beam you some snacks david but we haven't developed that technology yet no <laughs> we do i have my coffee you will be able to send you some snacks so, all right okay, take care enjoy the meeting i will always good to see you my friend me too good to see you
It's got a smartphone adapter on it and it uses a smartphone as a guide. My guy, the video of this guy was moving, he was really flipping out about it. But he did a challenge. He said, I want to see his movie. And this is the same, so about 10 to 15 minutes. I'm on the TV. Presentation. I mean, I don't have to work. I don't want it. 
Something that you guys just like doing and yep. bring them over. I'm gonna bring them down and they can buy some snacks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna do it. This is the one here. I don't know. I was not into the future. Back in the 90s, okay. Okay. Honestly, <laughs> 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 Yeah, you're a YouTube influencer now. Yeah, I'm going to be in the video. Thank you. I do with it. You know how to use it. I thought on YouTube. Yeah. I'll have to see what happens. That sound. I haven't put out a YouTube video in a while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a question for the audience here. I'm uh, in the market to get a new telescope, but I want to get a Dobsonian because I like my Dobsonian and it's really easy to use for outreach. I am seriously considering getting one of these. A, you can't see that picture. It's a Celestron smartphone enabled Dobsonian and use the smartphone as uh as the guide to push to and uh the review i saw on youtube was the the guy was very enthusiastic about it and he gave himself a challenge to see a whole bunch of messy objects in 15 minutes using this and he was able to do it so i'm like wow that's pretty cool for outreach so i just wondered if anybody had an opinion about the Celestron app in the um, Dobsonian. I'm seriously considering buying a 10 inch. My, uh, my 8 inch Dobsonian is uh, 22 years old now, 23 years old, and it's showing its age. Bob, I would, I would keep the telescope as simple as possible. I mean, the smartphone's going to work for a while, but it's not going to work forever. The telescope, on the other hand, will work forever. Mm -hmm. Five minute warning. I'll do your pop. Get ready. Start back up in five minutes. So, I don't. We'll have to get a lot of support. Yeah. So, yeah. It's not going to be a I think it's going to be a 
which is your black field. We put out a photo of your black field on every one of Okay. Oh, we the slideshow is not running. Okay, from beginning. Okay. I'll do that in a minute. What I'm gonna do now though is hit this. I hit this. I'm gonna go to a couple of places. Um, It's right. <laughs> still in there so if somebody else wants to get to their stuff they're gonna have to log out so i wanted to do that what else did i want to do um i thought i wanted to do Yeah. Who else? I'll go ahead and from the beginning. Oh, here we go. Okay, it's it's already set up. So, free space E. Uh, All right, so I'm all set. I have. Oh, there's something else I'm going to do. I brought up that web page. I want to bring up one more web page. There we go. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm trying to bounce off the tire. I think, yeah. He's taking a break. Let's say one minute warning. Okay, one minute. All right, I lost. 
Okay. All right, it is 8.15. Okay. People here are getting back into their chairs. Welcome back to this meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society. I am Bob Trimble, your president. Um, so do we do we have any new members here? We have we have any do we have do we have a new member? We have a new member. Awesome. So yes, we we do have a new member. All right. Um. So welcome, welcome. So one of our members brought him in, so he, he didn't he didn't find us on the internet. Somebody brought him in, so that's awesome. So um, I'd like to remind you again, we're having a discussion group on the 28th at Laura Wade's in Bloomfield Hills. We're also having an astrophotography discussion group, early April, date to be determined at this time. So stay tuned for that. Any skill level. If you're interested in astrophotography, and I actually I am, so... Sometime early April, we'll be doing that. So now it is time for our, our feature presentation. And I'll turn the mic over to uh, our first VP, Dale Parton, to introduce our speaker for the night. Okay. Well, it's nice to be back in person at Macomb. It's been, what, three years, give or take? Three years. Um, I mean, we start off with just a handful of people tonight. Now I count 11 of us in person. So that's a good start. Uh, there was some confusion over what room we were going to meet in. Uh, I talked to the professor who's in our the room we were supposed to have. We're, we're good. We'll probably be back in this room probably next month or close to here. So anyhow, uh, tonight, Adrian Bradley is our speaker. Uh, he is pretty, actually pretty new to it, to this organization. I checked, he joined a little less than three years ago. Amazingly, amazingly, this is his second year already as treasurer. Um, wow. When you volunteer. Yes, when you volunteer, you get volunteered. Um, so Adrian has specialized in something that I never heard of before, landscape astrophotography. It sounds like a contradiction in terms, right? <laughs> uh, his topic tonight, chasing dark skies, why you should get an SQM-L meter, whatever that is. Adrian? All right. So it's time to sit here, share a screen, which we tested earlier. So if it doesn't work now, it's not my fault. That's screen one. That's screen two. Sure. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and get this started. Um, so the topic, Chasing Dark Skies, as you see here, you can see all the affiliations that I'm with. They're up there on the board. Uh, there may be one coming if the Archdiocese of Detroit will only respond to Brother Guy. Um, but he hasn't yet, so I don't have another one to add up there yet. Um, so I do a theme on Global Star Party, which is something that Explore Scientific does. And my theme is Chasing Dark Skies. And I've got various talks based on my love of the night sky and chasing 
skies like that you see on the screen. Interestingly enough, what you see on the screen is the Milky Way, but not the popular Milky Way um, area. That's actually the Cassiopeia and Perseus side. And you do see some high cloud creeping in above it. And I've got it framed with trees. So we say, what is landscape astrophotography? This is something that needed to have a name because a lot of people like to combine the dark sky with some sort of beautiful foreground, a landscape. If you think about landscape photography, you're shooting at a mountain or a meadow and some peaceful scene somewhere where you don't live and, um, and it's considered a great landscape. At night, what photographers have decided to do is to learn how to capture this big old thing called the Milky Way and make it a background to a scene at night. And then somehow it's considered astrophotography. It doesn't have the same quite discipline or knowledge of the night sky that astronomers have. Um, and when I go to chase dark skies, I'm going to be talking about this sky quality meter. Um, I approach my photography from an astronomy standpoint. I'm looking at the sky. I know that the sky is going to rotate a certain way. There's something coming. There's something going. I you know, things like composition and stuff with photography, all of that happens. But um, the important thing is. I'm making the sky the star more so than the ground. The ground is there as the background for the sky. It's a little bit of a backwards thought. But let me go into, um, I'm going to go to the next slide. And we'll talk about what is a dark sky. And I'm holding this up as the hint as to one of the ways that you can um, get a scientific reading and actual measurement of they're saying they can't see it uh, oh because i just went to yeah you all can't see me holding up the sky quality meter but that's because i'm doing a presentation so we'll switch out of the presentation and hold this up a little later so for this slide you know it said many people from seasoned visual astronomers Master photographers reading this would probably bore us all to death. But the bottom line is we all have an idea of what dark is based on our experience in in this hobby, where we've gone, star parties, places where they actually look at the sky with their eyes. And um these sort of things define for different people what a dark sky is. And what happens is we describe it to somebody and say, it's really, really dark here, or it's really, really dark there. And then the new, the new astronomer comes in and goes, really? And, and then someone else comes and says, oh, no, there's nothing. Now, wait till you go here. That's really dark. And then there becomes a little bit of confusion as to what dark is. So just talking about that. Some of you've heard this when the Milky Way casts a shadow. Couldn't see my hands in front of my face. I can see something naked eye like M33, um, Triangulum Galaxy. Um, some places you can see it with averted or perverted vision. Other places you can kind of see it for real. Now, the image that I'm showing behind you is an image taken from a place where you could see um, M33, definitely in binoculars, depending on the night, you could see it naked eye. And some of the things, things along that plane of the galaxy that are visible naked eye, if not at least in a small set of binoculars. Let's see. Okay, the mouse shows up. Good. These areas here, 
These are all objects M22, M8, M20, M23, M17, 16, NGC object, Sagittarius star cloud, body's window down here, this whole area. That's M6, the butterfly, M7, Ptolemy's, and so on. So a lot of that's visible. You go to a sky that you may say, well, it's dark, but you try and look for that and you don't see it. That gives you an indication that, well, you might not be in as dark a sky as you think. However, that all depends on your eyes as well. And if you're used to looking for something in a dark sky. So I come back from a dark place like this place, Okitex in Kenton, Oklahoma, and then I look at a lesser dark sky, but then I still recognize some of the things that I now know are there from seeing it at Okitex. And I might point those out, but I didn't recognize them before because I didn't know they were there. Or I didn't see them. So rec recognition and um, experience in different skies helps. So as I was coming along, and learning to do photography like this, there are places where I'd look up and go, wow, this is pretty dark. And as I spoke, most of you all, places like Lake Hudson, and I'm gonna go through some places where I've done some photography and that's where the SQM meter comes in and the numbers, it's gonna show the different numbers, the type of photography that I can do in these numbers, but um, it's also gonna show a better way than just saying, you know, there are ways to do a fair assessment if you don't have an SQM meter, SQML meter, but the equivocal way is to get one. And I think I have a picture of it in this slide too. So that's how people will see it. Where do you get them? Um, you can get them online. Amazon sells them. There's, I think you can also buy them direct. Um, this is Unihedron. They may have a site. The easiest way is to go to Amazon and look for Unihedron sky quality meter. I think they do have the old SQM, which we discussed as a wider angle beam that it shoots out to determine darkness around 42 or so degrees. This one shoots at around 10. So a more narrow slice of the sky and um, students out there. More narrow slice of the sky and a uh, a smaller slice. So giving a, in in my mind, gives a better reading. So these four images that I posted up here are all from different areas, different portal zones, which I'll discuss. Um, and I wrote a couple of things that you can tell. Now, if you look at the most clouded out image up here, once again, we'll do, we'll get the mouse going. The most clouded out image here, notice the difference between these clouds and all this bright, these bright clouds here. Notice how these clouds are a little less bright. Um, even in, we're gonna turn it down here a little bit. So, where's my mouse? All right, so even here, I'll, I'll describe where these are. So this is, this is off of Lake Huron around Port Sanilac. Um, you can sit over there if you want. So this is off of, um, if I get my mouse back, where to go, okay. Port Huron, Sanilac, and there's a lot of light pollution. And this is where the center of the galaxy starts. This is Lake Hudson Dark Sky Preserve. And you can see how the Milky Way looks here, how this rift looks, compared to how the rift looks here. This is Upper Peninsula near Paradise, Michigan. And um, using very similar times to collect the Milky Way, you see the difference even with the clouds covering in, you see how much brighter this appears. This is Oklahoma, 
the um, the clouds are really, really dark, the Milky Way shines through. And in this image, the goal was to show what we were seeing, seeing, which was the Milky Way shining through. And even though there's all this cloud cover, because the rainstorm had just passed, the Milky Way is still visible. Whereas if a rainstorm passes in one of these two places, it just generally gets washed out. So you can look at appearance. If you're looking at an image, or if you're looking at it naked eye, the more Milky Way you see, the darker you can presume that that site is. The Milky Way shines brighter in darker in darker areas. Here we go. This is the SQM slash SQML meter. You're seeing it, those of you online, you're seeing a picture of it that I took. And those of you in the audience, feel free to pass around. So, so what I actually did was I linked to that wiki article, and what I'm going to do is go to the Bortle scale. And we're going to talk a little bit about what this is. So they're saying Bortle class one, excellent dark sky site, and and it looks like they've uh, twenty one point ninety nine. I've only seen twenty one point ninety nine on a SQM scale once, and that was out at Okie Techs at a part of the night, it happened to read 21.99. We pressed it again and it read 21.95. Due to turbulence, atmosphere, those readings change over time, um, depending on what's going on. So what you do is you take an average. So excellent dark sky somewhere between 21.2. Um, and this shows um, things that cast shadows. I could say that I saw a bit of a shadow from Okie Text, but uh, the main thing is the Milky Way shows up and is sitting in the sky as though it belongs there. And um, coming from here, a place like Michigan, it's this faint, fuzzy wispy thing that you happen to notice and you go, oh, there it is. Now, Bortle 2, you get reading 21.9. Um, that's still really, really good. That's when I go to the UP with that meter, it's my hopes that I see what the numbers are. The numbers I expect to see are 21.6 which it's saying Boral 3 is saying rural sky. Now, we think of rural sky, we think of places like where you live, Dale, where there's not as many people around. Those skies actually tend to read more like rural suburban transition. The darkest lower peninsula places in Michigan sit in this range. They used to sit up here, as of 2015, they sat in Bortle 3. The readings coming from there were 21.6. They are now no higher than 21.8. And they go all the way down to 20.4. And limiting magnitude, this is limiting magnitude for those. Um, the Milky Way well above the horizon is still in but lacks detail. Perfect description for the types of skies we have in Michigan. Humidity, lakes, there are a number of reasons that our skies don't match some of the skies that are out west due to the elevation. Out west, if it's drier, your sky is different, has more of a grayish hue to it. 
when you see when you um when you're dark adapted and or when you're taking wide angle night skate pictures. Suburban sky Stargate is probably between Bortle 4 and Bortle 5 here. You've got a suburban sky that can get down to 19.5. It can get as good as 21.4. I imagine on some nights you all get to 20.5, 20.6 with an SQM meter. So you're actually at the low end of Bortle 4. And at the low end of Bortle 4 is when you know the the amount of light coming from the night sky you know gets to it gets to a point where images of it look different compared to images and astrophotography it takes more frames more data you have to sit there and collect it in longer times to get the type of detail that you could get with less time the lower the number the more light is coming in from space. That's the best way to, to think about it. Now, if you're in Detroit, Portal 8, yeah. Portal 9, and it's Portal 17. Because look, less than 18 point. We blew an 8.42 in the room. So that means broad daylight, and I've Maybe I'll try broad daylight and see if, if the meter see if still even works after that. So, so let's carry on with the um, carry on with the presentation. I'll stop and say if, if there's any questions, feel free to stop me and ask them. What do those sites usually cost? Um, somewhere around 150. I think you were finding out 150 to 200 bucks for an SQM meter. So. Let's look that up. I'm going to take the time to do that because I, yeah, we're going to go. John E. Bortle created the scale, published it in February 2001 of Sky and Telescope. Um, John E. Bortle um, made it because I recall, I seem to recall the Bortle scale being shifted to where Bortle 1 was a little lower on the SQM meter scale. And now Bortle 1 has kind of gone up to this magical, like high, it, the, the scale has shifted around. So it's worth homework. To look it up um, and see since 2001, I'm willing to bet scale has slid based on observations or um, or maybe disappearing skies in terms of uh, darkness. Um, right, but yeah that's okay yeah so rather than a wholesale scale like bob said it's a refinement of where those levels are yeah so yeah the the equivocal i'm trying to think if that's the right word whatever that reads is what it reads and portal scale is a way to think about like overall darkness but what the scale says, the SQML meter says, is the objective reading of darkness in that sky. And if you look at that meter, it shows that once you get to, it goes up to 21 and shows a bunch of stars, and it goes down to 16 and shows a full moon. And so even if you didn't use the Bortle scale, you still have an idea based on your readings where you know where okay this is pretty dark it's showing a 21 and above versus i'm at a 16 and the full moon is out isn't out i must be somewhere in a suburb and i must be in a suburb and park with a street light not far from me or maybe i'm in detroit so yeah <laughs> Is there a 
That is a good question. And the question is, what's the minimum classification for you to be considered a dark sky? And so here's magnitude here. So my guess is you need to be at least six. Magnitude six to be a dark sky. I am going to type this in the presentation since we have internet. Right, and it does depend on your eyes. My eye may not see a certain magnitude that yours might, but. So this is dark sky grading by a guide on. Let's look at a guide to dark sky classifications. Okay, I agree. But this doesn't look like it's being written by like the International Dark Sky Association. That's who we need. But um, so they do reference the idea. This is the this is Yeah, I think that was somebody that was giving an opinion. I think 5.5 .5 is dark. Yeah, that's also Bortle 5. Yeah. One of the things that I had heard not too long ago is that a lot of cities are switching because of uh, it being a lot less expensive to go with LED lights. Yes. They will just wreck the sky. Less. Yes. Um, so if if they put fixtures, oh, the comment is that cities are going to LED lights because they're less expensive. But um and that's not me up there. I probably should delete this guy, but uh here, let's go away. But um $155. Yeah, say it again. $155. $155 to buy an SQML meter. But they're saying people are are getting cities are getting LED lights. And I think your comment was that the LED lights will trash the skies because of their brightness. The range. The range. So Dark, um, dark sky preservation groups have been asking cities to go with fixtures to point all of that light downward. There are some places you can go to, like Kearney, Nebraska. They have a park that they turn their lights on, and you'll notice fixtures are all blocking light from going up into the sky, and they're all pointing downward. That's an example of something that, um, you know, dark sky preservation groups are trying to get cities to do in addition to you know buying led lights that are brighter than all of outside or brighter than the sun um get some fixtures and point those downward so that any light that you're casting goes where it's needed and doesn't leak out into the sky by doing that it preserve it keeps that footprint down somewhere 10 miles away, 11 miles away, we'll see less of your light and have less of a light dome to where now the sky will start. And that helps enhance the darkness. But then it has to be in dark sky preserves. Um, it's, it's a uh, site where we have to guarantee it's going to be at least dark. And what I'm seeing from Lake Hudson, the edge of Bortle 4 seems to be that edge where you're saying it's dark sky. I was looking it up over here to see if that's officially what they're saying. It's a good question. Like the previous case around there, the International Dark Sky Association said it has to be on the 20 or farther. Where did you, which one? This one? Or this? That this, this no. Let's go here. So, side night magazine. Okay, so this. So, when I clicked on this, oh, yeah, I saw that. It, what part of that? It said it has to be 20 and had to be like, um, here we go. Okay, an international dark sky reserve must have brightness of no more than 20 magnitudes per square arc second. 
and must be public or private land of it. 70 square kilometers, probably. I'm not sure how many miles that works out to, but that's the answer. That's the answer. So go to the scale yeah. and you can be somewhere between six magnitude to 20.4 yeah. and five six is so you're looking at five and eight closer to six yeah human eye can see the best of them can see up to magnitude seven go here your limiting magnitude starts to affect what you can see but then that's when you know, you're looking at things like the summer Milky Way still appears complex and the uh, clouds are illuminated near the horizon, dark overhead. We had a slide where we showed how dark those clouds get. So you have other tells, but like the limiting magnitude in those guys gets up to here. Whether you can see all those stars, one test you can do is to look at the Little Dipper wherever you are. And the darker the sky, the more obscure the Little Dipper gets because there's actually actually more stars around a little dipper the a site where you can just make out all of the main stars of the little dipper runs in at around the uh somewhere between Bortle four and Bortle five mag limiting magnitude of six because i believe the bull stars are like with Kochab and on around three four five and six the faintest stars magnitude six so here you are. That's a question, Venus, you asked Dale. So the question is for those in the audience, um, if you point an SQM meter at Jupiter, do you get a brighter number than if you point it at a patch of dark sky? Um, I've pointed it at the Milky Way, I've pointed it away from the Milky Way, I've pointed it towards a planet, away from a planet. And when I take my readings, I tend to point to the darkest patch not sitting in the Cygnus region of the Milky Way. Yeah. And what I tend to get, there are times I pointed at the Milky Way. What I tend to get are numbers that range from, say, 21.2 which is a pretty good number, you know, that's over here, Bortle 4. Um, I'll get 21.1 or I'll get 21.05, something like that. So I take an average of the numbers that I'm getting. So one reading is often not enough. Dale. So, two things. The question is, if you're at a real dark area, you'll get a better reading at 1 in the morning than you will at 11 if you take two readings. It's a very good experiment to try. However, that works for places that are around businesses. Go, where, go up to Alcona where the businesses are far enough away and you're governed more by astronomical twilight than you are actual business. If there are businesses shutting down lights, you may see a couple tenths of difference in your sky. And I have done some sky readings earlier in the morning. It also depends on what type of sky you have at one in the morning as well. So if you're close enough to where you've got a light dome with some businesses, then yes, that may affect the sky. But overall, it's not going to change very much because a lot of those businesses are going to leave their lights on, especially car dealerships, gas stations. And there's going to be an overall reading. When you take more than one reading, you, you, you end up with an overall portal sky reading. And the further you are away from businesses, the less you depend. Now, the sun, 
further away from the sun goes here, further away from our horizon, will you get a darker um, reading? We think we will because there's less, but at a certain point, the sun's light is blocked by the horizon. But then two, if the Cygnus region is what's rising and then the Cygnus region gets up here and it's as bright, if not, it's as bright as the core of the galaxy, then it may mess with your readings. The best thing to do is to take multiple readings, point them at different areas of the sky and see what you get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And so, depending on the time of year, it can be 11 p.m. We're in the astronomical darkness. So, 1 p.m., we're still in astronomical darkness. So the number a.m., not 1 p.m. Yeah, that's that's Iceland, 1 p.m. when it's dark. Um, so yeah, that's, so what Dale was basically describing at six degrees below horizon, it's civil twilight, 12 degrees, nautical twilight. And at nautical twilight, I will show, let you know, the darker the site, the more the Milky Way you're actually able to see at nautical twilight. It is it, it gets that bright. One more question and we'll move on. One thing I noticed is uh, either you got a beautiful dark sky, no clouds. If it's a little bit and you got snow on the ground, it just seems like that snow reflects an awful lot of light from wherever it's coming from. It, it, it's just, uh, light. To your eyes. A camera is going to, if it's dark, a camera is going to see the same level of lumens coming from the stars as, you know, the snow reflecting. That's our eyes catching it. And if you've got a lot of light nearby, you, that's going to, you're going to reflect it. Again, how many of you have been to a place that has been considered truly dark? And that which which place did you go to? Let's let's take the time to go around the room. Way up in the UP and in northern Canada. Okay. Okay, so here's some places way up in the UP and in northern Canada. Yes. I was 80 years old now. When I was a kid, my dad and I were playing the Lawn and look up at the stars, and then every now and then there'd be an aurora. I said to my dad, What could possibly be doing that? I mean, well, you, you have the land of the midnight sun way up north, so this is the sun reflecting off the place. <laughs> yeah, so we have the thumb, the thumb of in, a, in a story, although it may not be true, it was a very heartwarming story of how aurora comes in. Okay. You were in, you were in a border one zone. You were in a border one zone. Mark. All right. Warren, Michigan. Yes, you've been to those spots. Death Valley gets to, of course, you didn't have an SQ meter to find out, but I'm pretty sure. I'm going to show. I'm going to show readings in places I've been and what the Bortle, what the SQ and meter showed as, you know, and the thumb is one of those places I'm going to show. So, uh, really quick. Yeah, I, I 
I'll have something for you. And Bob, I ate the same thing, right? Yep. David, where's the um, darkest place you've been, David? The darkest spot is our local astronomy club's Chiricahua Astronomy Complex. It's the darkest sky I've ever observed from. There I'm we go. Sure it's Portal 1, but it's it's pretty close to it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure it is. Um, so in, in the instance of time, let's go ahead and shoot through the other eight slides I have. And I am going to talk about places that I've been. Now, here's Lake Hudson Dark Sky Preserve. And here are some of the images I've been able to get from Lake Hudson Dark Sky Preserve. This is a 20.6 max, 20.5 average with a horizon. And you can see the glow on that horizon at 19.6. So if we remember our scale, and you're seeing the types of images. What I did is I show a Milky Way core image that I got. I show an Orion side, and you can see some dust lanes here, and that's Orion rising. Remember this image, because when I get to some darker places, that's going to have a lot more detail to it. And then that's the Cygnus region. Those are three of the four areas that we can see in the Northern Hemisphere of the Milky Way. When I see the Milky Way, I do not just stick with the core. I'm going to put a, I don't stick with just this. A lot of imagers will and call it Milky Way season. You're going to hear people say Milky Way season is coming back. Milky Way season never, ever leaves. It is always among us. Just shoot Orion in the winter if you can stand it. So that is Lake Hudson Dark Sky Preserve lower part maybe i should put a map of where it is because that would that way all of you in the audience see where it is all of you david can't see okay in yeah right here david that's where lake hudson dark sky preserve is he can now because i'm putting it on the camera so near toledo ohio if you think about michigan so um Let's go to the next dark area. This is in the thumb. Look at the reading along Port Sanilac, Danville. Um, this is the mid thumb. And these are, so once again, you have, and you got clouds. It's getting clouded out and I still, this is the ISS, folks. Oh. That's the ISS the streaking through that is where the moon is about to rise causing some of this color there's some light pollution causing the rest of it as the bulge in the thickness region thickness rift right here over here you see a little longer exposure capturing the core and you see some of the dust lanes in the region where orion is over here rising we kind of missed Orion itself, it's like down in here. This is the very definition of what a Bortle 4 zone is. What you were seeing was actually Bortle 4, even though it was that dark. In 2015, it may have been called Bortle 3. It was darker, but the sprawl of light has begun to crowd it out to the point where the SQM meter, wherever it is right over here, is now showing a max of 20.9 when I point this thing at the sky at Port Sanilac or on this beach, which is a little past Forrester in the thumb. So it's surprising that skies like that actually aren't showing a lot of reading, a, a bigger reading than that. Even more amazing when you get up into the northern part. Here you go, David. Now I'm up in here. This is a lot of farm country. This is a lot of the type of sky that you remember. Um, it's, you know, this was, this I think I used some stacking to get all of this detail in the Milky Way here. And of course, the modified camera on all three. Um, this image I'd like to retake, but there's Andromeda. This is the Cygnus region. 
the Cassiopeia um, as the Cygnus region set. There's some glow. There's still some glow from light, but this part is the darkness that you remember. And yeah, this one happened to catch David Eicher, the uh, senior editor of Astronomy Magazine. That caught his eye. Um, there's Orion right here above the tree. And um, and it was only 21, 20, 23. Remember, that's still Bortle 4. So even though the sky is getting darker and I'm able to get more detail in Milky Way shots, I'm still in a Bortle 4 sky. So these are skies that were called Bortle 3 and borderline Bortle 2 in 2015. And they included some SQM readings, 21.6, 21.7. If you go look at dark sky charts, if their data is from 2015, they're going to have 21.6, 21.7. I got 21.23 in that region. So next, one of my favorite places at the tip of the thumb, Point o Bark Lighthouse Park. Look at the detail I got in the two minute image of the uh, core. Look at the aurora that I got in a little Milky Way here too, looking at the lighthouse and look at the sky glow that I got over here. Look at the, it just so happens that the aurora is separated from kind of a, an area where you can see more sky glow here, but then over here you don't see quite as much. And look at the sky color too. Notice the metallic blue, except for here, is lit up by aurora. Note, notice the metallic blue of the sky. That is consistent with these numbers. Portal 4 numbers have a metallic blue sky when you image them. Now, imagers will change the sky color no matter where they are. They'll try and match this metallic blue color. But when you go to places darker, this metallic blue starts to turn grayish. And places that you've been, if you got dark adapted, it probably seemed gray, almost black where you were. Um, it does. It's a little bit of light scattering out. The lakes just provide more humidity to the point where only so much light is getting through because we're, we've got humidity floating around in our skies. So if I'm not mistaken, that affects, I think that affects our transparency. Um, it affects one of them, seeing or transparency. As the guy giving the talk, I ought to know that. I looked it up once. I'm going to have to look it up again. So my apologies. Um, but the bottom line is those lakes do affect how dark it can get. Even in the UP, it does get darker. And that's one of the sites that I need to go do my experiment to see what numbers I get there. Because I'm very curious to see if they get Bortle 2. I'm sure that they'll get to Bortle 3. But I don't know if they'll get to Bortle 2 or not. And I'm curious to see what's going on. Here's the another tip of the thumb where I ended up. This is the Port Crescent region. This is what you remember. This is what you remember seeing. Now I've got the California nebula and everything. And Jeff, we'll see you later. Keep looking up. Yep, we'll keep looking up. Sometimes we'll use our eyes, but other times we're taking pictures, man. Almost. Jeff is our observatory director. And uh, look, David, David has seen skies like this, but as he can attest to, as he's here watching, sometimes you just want to look up and you just want to see it with your eyes before you put any kind of camera to it. Look, when you see a sky, now this is image, it wasn't as clear. But I could see a faint wisp of the Milky Way here. This is Albert Sleeper Park. I'm pointing at it with my hands. Albert Sleeper State Park, a kind of a hidden gem for dark sky. If you can carry your camera over a small little walk, a little bridge, set up shop, or carry your, carry your uh, light scope 
and do some observing. There are some trees over here, but you've got Saginaw Bay and the horizon. A little bit of light pollution down there, you notice. And then if you come out to Port Crescent State Park, this is near the Dark Sky Preserve. Yes, I use two minute exposure, one for the ground, one for the sky and combine them. So the sky is a solid two minute exposure. And um, and look at all this stuff. And this, this is a good example of when they talk about landscape astrophotography. They're calling it astrophotography. But if you compare just taking a two minute exposure to the work that Dale and other astrophotographers here do, it doesn't give it justice. What I'm doing is doing a long exposure on a tracker. The one similarity is in order to get a long exposure of the sky, you have to follow the Earth's rotation. So you have to have a tracker or at times I've used small equatorial mount and mounted my camera to it and let that track. And when I wanted to get the ground, I shut the tracker off. After I get my sky shots, one one technique I'm going to consider is doing um, more thirty second shots, or you know more get tracking where I still have a decently sharp ground, let it follow, and then punch it into some software that can align the ground underneath and stack the sky. So there's some experimenting to do, but my base, how I get these photos, long exposure of each two minutes. Well, not so long compared to the five minutes that, or even 10 minutes sometimes that astrophotographers will get if they're tracking and they're guiding. If I begin guiding with my setup, that'll be interesting. But then at some point, this isn't going to look the same. It's gonna turn a Bortal 4 zone into something that looks like it could be Bortal 1. And part of the goal of my pictures is to present what I see, not just over embellish the sky and then the ground is there and then it's not balanced. So I do like the method that I use because um, it's just above what you can really see with your naked eye in some of these zones. But if I use the same process everywhere I go, then I'm showing a difference in how these skies look and what the SQM readings are, SQML readings. So this is the tip of the thumb. Again, I do wish I had the UP, but um, let's see here. Oh, here we go. Now we're in, those are images. Let's look at these, we'll go backwards. Peach Mountain with a with a long. Um, this is an image of me looking at the Milky Way from a decent spot near Ann Arbor, Michigan. Look at all the light glow here. But you know, in the plains, plains are everywhere. But um, look at all the light glow as compared to what you're gonna see when I go backwards one slide. Here's this image. I actually did an image for it. Um, or a slide for it. There's Stargate. There's a uh, there's Milky Way going over Stargate. I'd like to hit Stargate when it's a better sky and see if I can get some readings for it as well. Um, out here at Alcona Campground, there was a uh, this, and it's hard to see, but this is actually the lunarly eclipsed moon with. Orion and the Milky Way. This is the entire sky, the way it looks during a lunar eclipse before we crack into astronomical twilight. No SQM reader reading here, but some of those other readings I had show 21.23. That's what I would have expected for this. This is the Upper Peninsula, and this is Aurora that I did not see or detect until I put my camera and aimed it north, and the Aurora showed up. This is where I expect a 21.5 or a 21.6. When you look at the Milky Way up here, you see defined dust lanes. And that's always a sign that you're in a, you are in a dark area when you see that. Here at Port Crescent, this is the actual dark sky preserve. And I was able to get this in the two minute exposure. It was rather clear. I bet 21.2. 
I may have gotten close to 21.3 had I had an SQM meter. Back to compare this and this, Point of Bark Lighthouse Park again wasn't such a dark night, but meter reading 21.2. Yes. The lighthouse is this big? The sky is as big as this room. Starlight is going to come down regardless because this light is not enough to wash the Milky Way out. The sun is what washes, or huge city light pollution is what washes the Milky Way out. Not one lighthouse or it's a couple of other lights that are nearby in an otherwise very rural area. It's just not enough light. Now, if I go sit next to this lighthouse and image, I've actually done that, and I still have the Milky Way you know, showing up, and I'm standing next to the lighthouse and shooting around it, so I have a window of the lighthouse and the Milky Way going up. The sky's just too big. The question was, why doesn't the lighthouse wash out the uh, Milky Way in the shot that I have down here. And that's because the lighthouse is just way too small for the universe. Yeah, the, the light is directed. Yeah, it is directed at me, actually. That light shoots. In falling conditions, you can actually see that light being yeah. rotating light. Yeah. This one, only it, it shoots at a wide angle directionally northwest and southeast and we are standing southeast in that photo but like i said it also there's hardly any other light around there to cast into the sky and wash out the milky way that's a two minute exposure now notice the difference on an exceptional night in Danville in this yard i ended up with a pretty good it's a little more definition of the thickness region than in here so the night it does depend on um it does depend on the night and it does you know you go back to these regions and get more readings you get an even better idea of what the average reading is on any given night at a particular site but uh the more businesses gas stations light pollution exists the more your sky is going to be affected. For instance, um, this is the point at which in the south um, west, if you look southwest as you go up to the thumb, you see a glow from Detroit. That glow doesn't really stop till you get about here where that lighthouse is. And then it finally is no longer bright enough to affect the southwest part of the sky as you're as you're going in the thumb. That's how that's that's when you're influencing how bright the sky is when you're a big city like Detroit. As opposed to yeah, Port Huron does a number um when you shoot along the thumb and you shoot back this way to the south, Port Huron will be in all of your shots. Now want to know what dark really is? Yeah. This. Whoa. Look at the reading and look at the detail that I'm getting now. When I stack the picture in, at Alcona, and this is where, you know, Jeff will have to watch this. This image was only two minutes, and I had to stack 10 one minute frames to get a similar look in Alcona County of the core. The zodiacal light, this isn't just me imaging it with, you know, the modified camera, so you see Barnard's loop and all of this. Um, that zodiacal light is easily visible. You will see it make an X in the sky with the uh, part of the Milky Way where Orion is. Now, for a fun fact, if we could see through the horizon, down to about here, we would start seeing the Magellanic Clouds. It, they never come up high enough at our latitude and even lower latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere to be visible. 
but they hang off of the region where Orion is here, some parts of the Southern Hemisphere, they get to see Orion low to the horizon, and then higher in that horizon, they see the Magellanic Clouds. So depending on the season. So that this is how close we come to seeing the Magellanic Clouds. This is how close we come to seeing Crux. You probably saw Crux. You probably saw Ada Carine where you were, it may have been high enough to show both sides of the bulge of the Milky Way. Yeah, you can see it from there. Um, you get down here and you're seeing the rest of Scorpion um, Nebula and the stars here. And you get down into here, you start seeing Centaurus, things like Omega Centauri, Things and then beyond Centaurus is the Southern Cross, the Jewel Box, the uh, Pole Sack, and the bright Ada Carinae region. Ada Carinae, it's pretty bright. I guess if you consider all of this going on here um, near California. You know, multiply by about three and you get what Ada Karen A looks like. I have my passport, so hopefully I will get a chance to go down south and actually image it because those are the only two regions I don't have. I have friends in Argentina, however. Um, you know them, David, Maxi, Cesar, um, Dr. Marcello Souza. We uh I will be utilizing these friendships to get down to Argentina and get the rest of the Milky Way as we can see it from Earth. But these are three of those four regions. And notice the grayish tone to the sky. That's a real gray, that real grayish tone is there. It's when it gets darker, you're no longer seeing, you know, you see sky glow everywhere. There's some sky glow showing up, depending on how I process it. Um, a little bit of haze here. Um, this is just showing how bright this radiates the Orion region. And remember, in our state, Orion, the Orion region is dim. In this state, and anywhere, anyone who's seen it, they know how bright this region actually looks. And this lights up during nautical twilight. You start seeing these dust lanes and everything. So, um, so it does get darker and even darker than this would be to get blasted off in the space where everything goes black. And then truly you can't make out any constellations at all. Here, you can sort of see that you can see them. If you're not used to seeing the sky that dark, it's gonna pepper, you know, it, it's gonna pepper you with a bunch of stars and you're going to, be confused. However, what I remember about this scene at the time, and this was in 2018, I think, I remember looking up and barely being able to tell where Cygnus was because there were so many stars around Cygnus. And my experience level at the time wasn't where it is now, but this was the darkest sky I had ever seen when I first saw it. Then this became the darkest sky I'd ever seen out of Peach Mountain. And it just gradually went to where this, until I went to Oklahoma, this was the darkest sky I had ever seen. And this was, this surprised me because I didn't think it would be as dark as these areas, but whether the transparency was good or the seeing was good or both, it was rather clear that night. Another thing that I, I've seen that when I visit with an open sky, I'm sometimes surprised that there's so many satellites. Just that yeah. I saw this moving up there. Yeah. Well, you see Starlinks, but you see geosynchronous satellites too. Yeah. And you, you see all sorts of things. And um, when you take images of them, 
you don't see him naked eye. You do see some satellites moving along if you, especially if you put the binoculars on, you'll see him. But you can see some moving along naked eye. Meteors, you see one every, you know, we have, we have our public that loves seeing meteors. All you got to do is go to something like the thumb and you see one every hour, maybe sometimes every, you know, 10 minutes or so. Just keep looking up. Yeah, if you're taking pictures, they're going to show up. And then most of the time, you're going to see planes. So, this image here is a, and yeah, never mind the noise here. This image is sort of a true to life image of what the Milky Way looks like naked eye. I, of course, have the slide stuff here, but uh, if you look at this region, you see naked eye. This this picture was not meant to embellish it like some of those other ones that longer exposure. This, I matched what I saw, maybe eight or 10 seconds. And um, let's see, it's nine. How much time? Am I way over time yet? I got eight minutes. Let me um, shift to some of these images. You know, including this, I mean, this is the very image that I took 49 seconds and I started to get that core that, um, you know, I saw all of this naked eye when I ended up in Oklahoma, however many years later, you know, after taking this. I could hardly see but a wispy white looking, you know, kind of trail or river in the sky. That's, you know, not long after that, we got meteors. Jeff would love this image because it's people actually setting up telescopes and trying to look at the sky, despite the fact that it's, uh, you know, cloudy out here. But you can see Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, there's a little dipper. Um, I don't know if I close this, if I'm going to break anything, but nope. Um, even in... When the moon is out, some of the Milky Way is visible. That's Lake Hudson a, year, a couple years ago. Even in uh, even in San Francisco, starlight shows up. Looks like a handle or dipper, but I can't really tell you that. Now. But uh, starlight shows up um, even in bright towns like this. If you're far enough away from the town, this goes to your point, Dale, about aren't these lights bright enough to wash out anything like it over Point o Bark Lighthouse, it didn't wash out the Milky Way. Better believe that. And all of this light, although you see it's pointed down, it's got fixtures on the top of it, but there's some lights up here. There's light shining up to show the Golden Gate Bridge. Best believe that all of this light combined is keeping me from seeing whatever else is going on in the southern part. This actually not at all will be a part of Sagittarius. So the Milky Way ought to be here, but there was no way you're gonna see that naked eye in San Francisco. Sausalito area. Oakland over here. Now the Pacific Ocean is over here. A lot of light, even through the fog that you see right now. Yep, this is the Sausalito. Right, so we're facing south. We're at the north side of the Golden Gate over here. Yeah. My house was just about half a mile south of San Francisco, a little block from the ocean. I used to great pictures just looking out over the ocean, but there's no light. Yes. And the very first pictures I ever got of Percy Nebula. We're from shooting and over the Pacific Ocean. Fantastic. Yeah, and see, that's the, okay, yeah. the other yep, you had mountains here. As long as you, yeah, where you were, you kept going on about a half mile down, and then that way yep. from here, you just drove on that way, and you got a view of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, I didn't, uh, because I was on foot, and I needed to see back on the other side, so I didn't get the, I didn't wander that way, mm -hmm. but, uh, now that I know that I had I had transportation and wandered that way, I might have been absolutely floored. 
Remember when we talk about the greatest comet that we'll ever see? Um, comet Neowise was a pretty good comet, and it it was fun to image. Neowise is a part of the night sky with everything else. And, you know, when I, when they say, and this is in a Bortle 5 slash Bortle 6 zone. So sometimes as a nightscape, we talk about nightscapes. Sometimes the Milky Way isn't your target. Be willing to shoot at something else that's interesting in the night sky. Or worst comes to worst, just shoot at the Big Dipper. And then uh, somehow this made a calendar. You know, sometimes the pictures, uh, like you catch the clouds as they're moving, and it looks like something you would see. If you were standing there with me, that's what you would see. And I think that'll capture people's imagination just as much as the big, garish, gaudy pictures with the huge, the Milky Way being this huge thing. Um, yeah. Without any sparks, other than just people. Right. This is the best you can do at a site. Hey, look, meteors. Oh, and this is that. This is um, in Ann Arbor, the rural Ann Arbor. Look at the look at the yellow here. Look at the light being captured. Sometimes, in the distance, the light pollution gets captured, reflected by the clouds. So, if you're far enough away, you might get enough data. On an image, this is the astrophotography part of landscape astrophotography. Depending on when you shoot, you might get pretty good data. These things are visible naked eye when you go to a Bortle, high Bortle 2, Bortle 1 site. And of course, I'm going to buy Bortle 21.8, 21, even 21.7. You can start seeing these little legs here, these little dust lanes. M11 is like right here. But Sometimes you can pull that data out in a less dark sky. Yep, Bob. Three minutes. Okay. So I will move quickly through the rest of these. Light pollution match. Here's one from 2022. Well, here's light pollution. Website here, light pollution map. Let's look at it. So let's say you're traveling, or just want to find out what light Talking about, you know, hey, seven years ago, the 2015 data is when you can click on different sites, it'll tell you. Oh, there it is, World Atlas 2015. Yeah. That's the one you can click on. So if you scroll over to our area, you can click around and see what. Uh, Let's see what happens. I've used this before. I don't have a light here, but I've used this, you know, if I'm traveling around. If I'm actually looking for a place to set up, I'll say, oh, I'll use this and, and uh, I'm to choose one spot over another. So let's, uh, let's use it. Notice what happens. When you do it. This is that little light right there, but do you believe it's four channel light? It's right here. And so you see how close it is. Other beach I shot. This right this is the Port Hope. Port Hope, actually, no, Port Hope is up in here. This is where the lighthouse. That light, this bright light right here, could well be Point O'Bark's lighthouse park. Let's get in. Notice how less, uh, yeah, it looks pretty good from here. This is the lighthouse. That's how the beach. That's the lighthouse right there. I think that's the beach. What is this? Uh, or am I wrong? Maybe this. No, this is that's Port Hope. This blur is the lighthouse. So, Dale, Port Hope. what's going to affect the sky more? 
this at Arbor Beach, Port Hope, or this wee little light surrounded by rural area and lake. Yes. Oh, here we go. Radio info. Oh, was given information on city. Well, if, if you if the overlay if you use the 2015 one, then it allows you to click and it will estimate that's the lighthouse drive. If that's the lighthouse, it'll estimate the that's the lighthouse. That's a 2015. Yeah. So if I go World Atlas 2015, yeah, you click on that, it'll it'll give you a SQM. Look at what it what used to be up here. What? What? Twenty-one point eighty-four. Wow. What was my reading? Twenty-one point two. Tenths of a meter matter. Yeah. So, and we thought that was well. That's yeah. That's the thought. That big area is the yeah. But my. If that SQ of meter says Bortle class four, six tenths down from eight years ago. So I could use this before to, to help you find a good spot. Like and it's, key. yeah, and it still is a, uh, let's see, this, yeah, this is just radiance info and it doesn't show, it shows that some of this data needs to be submitted. Um, this is where we shoot the El Sabo River and look at that, you know, if we, yep, that's where you kayak and if you should look at these numbers, this, this says it's Bortle 2, 21.9, 21.9, 21.9, what did I read? I read 21.25. That was 2015. This was 2021 when I was 2021 or 2022. Maybe it was 2022. And, you got Bortle one. and I got Bortle four. That's Bortle two. It says Bortle two, I believe. Yeah, class two. Two, two Bortles. So, you know, given the, the usefulness of the Bortle scale here is basically to show us that in some of these areas, we're losing the night sky. And now let's go, let's go visit David before he goes to bed. David, we know your time has come. Let's go, let's see if I can do this. I should be able to tap this and move it. Look at the Mississippi. Look at the skies west of the Mississippi. David is in here somewhere. That's Utah. That's Nevada. Oh, well, no. that's where it is. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Where are you, David? Somewhere not far from Tucson? In North Arizona. Uh oh, we can't hear you. I am about maybe uh, 30 miles to the southeast of Tucson in the little community of Vail. Let's go see if we can get southeast. Well, that means you're in an area, I think. Uh, you see it. So, that's 20.8, but, yeah, it says Bortle Class 4. 2015, so. There are light ordinances that have passed since then, right, David? Yes, there are, but um, but they don't seem to make a whole lot of difference. That's not good. Yeah. Yeah, but you have, um, no, where, now where you go to observe, is that a little further south? Oh yeah, south and east at the Chiricahua Astronomy site, which is just on the west side of the Chiricahua, soon to be National Park. Okay. Yes. 
Empire. Is it close? Though? Well, it can't be much further than this. This is the border right here. I'm thinking you're in. Well, this is a ranch. This is further south. Yeah. Uh, and then, look, you got mountains. So you got elevation. So, yeah, this is probably still 21.8. It, it probably hasn't changed since 2015 based on the way that the skies are described. And it's worth noting that at elevation, with better seeing, better transparency, the class may be Bortle 3, but the sky is still going to be brilliant. It's going to be great for observing. There isn't going to be much moving. So I've run into time. That was a good question. And uh, uh, vote for the politician that doesn't want it. That's about the best <laughs> way. Um, that's the only way. V, thank you for staying to watch the presentation. I and, really enjoyed um, it. Thank you. I enjoyed giving the presentation. You guys had some great questions. I think this is the type of discussion that our club is about. We want to know. Now we know what dark skies mean. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to stop sharing. Let's see if I can do that. Um, let's see. Or I'll just escape. You keep a lot of um oh, okay that's right yeah so right now this present right now this presentation is the log so i have to do numbers record numbers so that um Okay, well, so we're done here. Uh, let's again thank Adrian for his presentation. Thank you very much. Some of us uh, meet at the uh, National Coney Island on Van Dyke, uh, north of 12 Mile after this. Our next meeting will be Monday, April 3rd, in person at Cranbrook. Okay. We'll see you there. Good night, everyone. Good night. Go ahead, repeat that. Yep. Yep. <laughs>